We seem to be living in an era of remakes. While some of these are being celebrated as refreshing revivals that were sorely needed, others have us questioning whether there was any point to remaking the game in the first place. This is partly due to diminishing returns. The leap from the PlayStation 3 to the PlayStation 4, and even 5, is not as pronounced or impactful as the leap from the PS1 and N64 to the PS2, GameCube, and Xbox, when we also saw a similar trend of remakes. In a shorter time span, Resident Evil went from looking like this, to looking like this. Metal Gear Solid went from looking like this, to this. Conker's Bad Fur Day transformed from this to this, and Tomb Raider went from this to this. These weren't just graphical upgrades either. Resident Evil remixed the layouts, puzzles, and added new story elements. Metal Gear Solid became hilariously unbalanced due to the addition of abilities from its sequel that the original was not designed to consider or counter. Conker's Bad Fur Day was censored, which some found to be a deal breaker. Meanwhile, Tomb Raider was completely reimagined. As a massive Tomb Raider fan, that should be an incredibly exciting prospect for me, right? A new, better way to play one of my comfort games. Well, that word, reimagining, is key to understanding both the strengths and weaknesses of Tomb Raider Anniversary. I personally arrange remakes into three categories. You have the Shot for Shot remake, the same game rebuilt from the ground up with modern tools and brand new assets. Think Crash Bandicoot and Sane Trilogy. Then you have your remasters. This is a game from a previous generation, pretty much exactly as it was, but with improved resolutions and frame rates. The PS3 HD collections are good examples of this. Finally, our subject matter for this video, your reimaginings. What would this game look, feel, and play like if we were making it from scratch today using current game design best practices? Resident Evil 2 is the best example of this, where the fundamental gameplay has changed, the story has been altered, and you're exploring a brand new environment, all of which are only loosely based on the original. Tomb Raider Anniversary firmly sits in that latter camp of reimaginings. In fact, an in-game statement from Jason Botta, creative director of Tomb Raider Anniversary, states that the team were inspired to create a brand new game, heavily inspired by the original TR, not just a remake, but something more. And this is where that cause for concern is. Will a brand new game, based on the original, give me the same feeling and satisfaction that the first outing did? On the surface, the intent certainly seems to be there. Toby Gard, often credited as Lara's creator, had been brought back into the fold for the first time since the original Tomb Raider to work on the game prior to this, Tomb Raider Legend. He then continued to play a role in both Anniversary and Underworld. Looking at the interviews that came with the PS2 limited edition of Anniversary, the team as a whole seems genuinely passionate, excited, and well-meaning. Did the team achieve their vision? Is this a brand new retelling of Lara's first adventure that successfully modernizes and elevates the game for a brand new audience? Does it serve as an effective replacement for the original game? Or, in their efforts to create something new, did the team forget what made the original so special in the first place? Finally, if Anniversary is worth your time, which version should you play? It released on pretty much everything at the time. Settle in and make yourself comfortable as we answer those questions today. One of the most fundamental things to understand, and this will impact multiple sections of this review, is that Tomb Raider Anniversary follows and inherits a lot from Tomb Raider Legend. Legend was a reboot with a new developer, an updated control scheme, and different key gameplay pillars as their focus areas. Anniversary inherits so much from Legend 
you can still buy Anniversary as DLC for Legend on the Xbox Store. Legend released at a difficult time for Tomb Raider. The previous game, Angel of Darkness, had been so poorly received, critically and commercially, that it almost sank the entire franchise. Development duties shifted from Core Design to Crystal Dynamics, who completely reinvented Tomb Raider from the ground up. Crystal was successful in this, with Legend being a great entry into the series, but imagine having to immediately follow that up with a remake of the original game. Putting yourself in their shoes, you've just thrown out the rulebook and completely redesigned the fundamentals of this series, proving yourselves as capable and your new direction and vision as being solid to a very loyal and potentially critical fanbase. Now you have to apply that same approach to what's arguably the most sacred Tomb Raider game, the one that started it all. That's certainly a tall order. Lara's movement has been completely revised. The grid-based system and tank controls of old are gone, replaced with the third-person analog controls we're familiar with today. Grabbing ledgers is now done automatically, although there is an option to make it manual, and you can speed up Lara's shimmying and swimming speeds by tapping the north face button, so triangle on PlayStation or Y on Xbox. Lara can also now swing on poles, jump across small perches, and she has a grappling hook for not only swinging across long gaps, but also wall running. These introduce new and different challenges to the original game that we'll discuss in more detail once we get to chatting about level design proper. Lara can also fudge a lot of her movements, requiring a quick tap of the north face button to prevent her falling off the pole, perch, or ledge that she just grabbed. I never really got a feel for what triggers this, and it became a major issue leading to seemingly unfair deaths during timed challenges. Egypt, I'm looking at you. Generally, I found Lara's movements to be more fluid, but also more squirrely. I was never confident in how far Lara would travel or whether she would make certain jumps. In several cases, it seemed that the exact same inputs from me resulted in different outcomes from Lara. This was especially prevalent during wall running sections where I was required to leap away from the wall I was on. Lara seemed to magnetize towards certain platforms or ledges, possibly based on what the camera is focusing on. This can cause you to feel like you're actively fighting against the controls, especially when going for secrets that are off the beaten path. The general unreliability of Lara's movements will quickly become a source of frustration for you. These issues become particularly apparent in the game's time trial mode, and when going for achievements such as complete the central shaft of Lost Island without dying. You don't feel like you're in control. Your success or failure is not entirely up to you. I'll agree that the tank controls of the original were dated. They felt clunky at first and took some getting used to. I won't argue against that. However, once you had a firm grasp of those controls, you could be confident in knowing exactly what Lara could and couldn't do, with deaths being your own fault and some of the secrets rewarding mastery. These new controls conform to the expectations of modern players. Your average gamer can realistically pick this game up and start playing it, most likely without needing a tutorial. At the same time, the lack of rigidness also presents a lack of precision. The flow of movement is entirely different, as you're no longer having to survey your environments and plan your moves before executing them but a rare instance of tracing a path from your destination to a potential starting point. These new movement options would give a greater sense of confidence while navigating these environments, if the controls could be trusted. Fortunately, the unfair deaths you will face as a result of these unreliable controls aren't as devastating as they could be. In the console versions of the original Tomb Raider, you could only save your progress at single-use, predetermined save points. 
If you died, you went back to your most recent save, sometimes losing significant progress. Tomb Raider Anniversary gives you frequent automated checkpoints, so when you die, you're only ever losing about a minute's progress. You can retry segments as many times as you like without consequence, so deaths quickly become a minor inconvenience. That takes away from the original sense of danger and peril. Where I would be careful before, fearing being sent back a fair ways, now I'm more willing to experiment and act recklessly. This modernization alters your behavior as a player, fundamentally changing the experience, in my opinion for the worse, ridding the game of its tension and lowering player engagement. The combat mechanics have also been updated. Previously, Lara would automatically lock on to nearby enemies while your guns were drawn. Now you have a manual lock-on that allows you to swap targets by flicking the right stick. With the exception of the Uzis, you tap to fire rather than holding the button down, which feels unnecessarily manual. The enemies appear to have been made more agile and aggressive to account for the player's increased fluidity. They also seem to hunt in packs, higher numbers of foes that no longer wait their turn before coming at you. These changes can result in some frustrating situations where you get dogpiled or trapped in a corner. The game also seems fond of ambushing the player with enemies in tight corridors where you don't have much space to manoeuvre or dodge, often leading to what feels like unavoidable damage. In particular, Flying Atlanteans can stunlock you and push you off high ledges. Although I suppose that's nothing new. Fights are trivialized and swing wildly back into the player's favor with one new mechanic though, the headshot. If you aggravate an enemy enough, they roar, a spark appears over their head, and they charge at you. Time a dodge just right, and you'll enter a Matrix-style bullet time. Pulling the trigger at the right moment here results in an instant kill. It works on literally everything and makes what could be some tense moments feel utterly trivial. That said, the timing for initiating it is as unreliable as the other controls. There were multiple times where I heard the sound cue, saw the visual blur on screen, hit the dodge button, but nothing happened. Sadly, this is also how almost every boss encounter, including the final boss, is handled. Shoot them to build up their rage meter, dodge, critical shot for damage, repeat. One of the few moments of variety or interesting mechanics comes in the form of these dual centaurs, where you have to steal their shields and then use those shields to reflect the boss's Medusa-like blasts back at them, turning them into stone. Considering this is Tomb Raider, you would think they would use those light puzzle mechanics in more bosses. Some encounters and bosses that were optional in the original game you could escape instead, and now mandatory here, and hmm, oh boy, I will be talking about how badly that T-Rex got mishandled later on in the video. You can also forget battles with human opponents. These have been turned into quick time events, which I'll discuss more when I get to the story breakdown. It does rob us of our constant battles with Pierre and Greece, though, making that entire section of the game lose one of its defining characteristics. Even the way you get the weapons feels like a downgrade. You still find them in the levels, sure, but the shotgun has gone from being on a platform next to the skeleton of its previous owner, to being in this random cave with no environmental contextual storytelling. There's also no real advantage to grabbing this shotgun, as only one level later, Lara will steal Larson's in a cutscene. The Magnums have gone from being behind a secret door with a fun and rewarding timed platform challenge, to just being behind some rocks along the level's mandatory pathway. 
Meanwhile, the Uzis have been downgraded from their kind of bullshit but absolutely memorable invisible floating platform to just being plonked unremarkably on the Sphinx's head. It's hardly a gaming memory that will stay with you like the original did. Also, I lost my magnums in the endgame. Anyone who knows Tomb Raider knows that you start in Atlas Mines without your weapons. In both versions, you find your pistols after completing a puzzle. In the original, you killed a cowboy to get your magnums back. Anniversary swaps this for Larson and your shotgun, which, don't worry, we will get into. You originally fought a skateboarder to get your Uzis back. This is now Jerome, a gang member. Finally, the big bastard Kane had your shotgun. In this remake, Kane attacks you with a knife and his fists, but drops your magnums. While I knew to grab the Uzis from Jerome, he used them in the cutscene, they're very obvious and visible when you regain control, that's not the case for the magnums. Kane didn't use them in the cutscene, so it's not obvious he has them. When you regain control, you're facing away from Kane's body, and Kane's black coat means there's no contrast or visibility for the equally black magnums. One change that I'm torn on is the maximum ammo count. The original game was happy for you to scoop up 999 rounds for a gun if you really wanted to but Anniversary gives each weapon a maximum capacity. This prevents the Resident Evil style hoarding and stockpiling that I used to do, encouraging me to switch weapons more often. Again, it takes the game away from its borderline survival horror roots, where collecting and saving resources was vital, into a use it or lose it action focused power fantasy. It just doesn't hit the same way it prompts a different player response. These gameplay changes also required alterations to the level's layouts, puzzles, and platforming challenges. By and large, the levels have been condensed, truncated, and made more linear. In some cases, entire levels have even been combined. The game's stages have this weird, uncanny sense about them. It's like seeing a friend you went to school with and only half recognising them. It takes your brain a moment to grab their defining features from your memory before saying, Oh yeah, James, I haven't seen you in years! This sensation starts as early as level 1. It opens with a new tutorial section, where you climb a mountain and open the gates to the first level proper. This does a decent job of quickly teaching and communicating the game's controls and mechanics, something the original outing was missing. In the 90s version, the tutorial was hidden away in Croft Manor. This was not only optional, but the second item on the main menu. Most players likely jumped straight into the game and missed out on this opportunity to learn the ropes, so this change makes sense. What does that mean for Croft Manor now? We'll get to that. Something you will notice about these tutorials is that they show keyboard inputs even if you're using a controller. The controller prompts do show in the options menu, but it seems the only way to have them display in-game is to manually unbind all of the keyboard controls. It's a really weird oversight that only impacts the PC version. Getting into level 1 proper and familiar territory, the opening trap can now be disabled. The first secret has been expanded, requiring many more jumps. This bridge breaks as a surprise for returning fans. This room with the wolves, a secret, and a timed lever door has been removed. Most importantly, you no longer see the exit early on. You lose that sense of having to take the long way around. There's no grander connective tissue, you just happen to stumble into the final area without any build-up. 
On the plus side, the bear pit finally got upgraded to secret status. I always thought it was strange that the original didn't treat it as such. On a slight tangent, the original game's secrets were normal item pickups. Going for them helped you get extra health and ammo. In this game, the secrets are artifacts that you can't use in gameplay. Instead, they unlock art galleries, alternate costumes, and developer commentaries. If you don't care for this stuff, then the secrets become much more skippable and optional. Going out of your way for them doesn't provide the same gameplay benefits that they once did. The second level, the city of Vilcabamba, really showcases how the level design philosophy has shifted. The original featured a large open area with various dead ends and distractions to get lost in. The reimagined anniversary puts all of this into a single camera shot and makes sure that each and every square inch of the village is utilised and explored. Even the central pool, which was originally optional and led to two secrets, is now mandatory for progression along the critical path. In the 1996 outing, there was a key midway through the level that was needed for the final door. You could easily miss this key, forcing you to backtrack, impressing the importance of exploration upon the player. The 2007 version still has the cubby where the key would have been, but both the key and the final room guarded by a bear were cut and no longer appear. The game is built to be more efficient than its source material, to eliminate so-called waste. The developers didn't want to spend time creating anything that the player might not see. The removal of this level's key also shows a commitment to streamlining the experience, to removing speed bumps and giving players a lighter, breezier playthrough. Some might see this as a good thing. Me? Not so much. Generally speaking, the game goes from a foreboding but rewarding sense of exploring a dangerous, unknown lost civilization to a guided tour or a curated and coordinated theme park ride. This becomes very apparent when we visit the Lost Valley, the first of a handful of completely redesigned levels. The original was a stage of two halves. A dinosaur infested jungle to the right held a series of machine cogs. A platforming heavy trail to the left led to the machine those cogs fixed. Once you were done, the water got redirected, revealing the path forwards behind a waterfall. You now start the stage facing the waterfall, giving your ultimate objective much more prominence. You're immediately given your first cog for free, and while a dilapidated machine that resembles the originals does exist, you now use these cogs on a mechanism immediately to the side of the waterfall to climb higher and higher. Your mission statement is uncompromisingly straightforward and borderline spoon-fed to you. The original's jungle was a series of interconnected and interweaving caves. While one of the cogs was perhaps a little too well hidden, it felt like a natural area. This reimagining loses that. It's not only a more linear and guided experience, it also feels like a set. Where you could trace where the water went in 96, 07 has waterfalls that don't go anywhere. It's a stage, superficial, it doesn't hold up under any kind of scrutiny and fails to feel like a real location you have discovered. It is, again, a theme park ride, an illusion. You no longer have an approach to the temple, you simply hop in there immediately after the T-Rex boss fight which Oh boy, I am holding that in for just a little longer! That sense of wonder of seeing the temple emerge from the darkness? Completely absent. Likewise, the framing of the level showed you the broken bridge that you would eventually leap across to get one of the gears. The height of this thing, and the fact you were shown it as your objective early on, made this a nail-biting and satisfying jump. It required a full run-up, jumping at the last possible second, and reaching out to cling on to the opposite edge to pull yourself up. In the new version, we see the T-Rex break the bridge in a cutscene, and when we reach it, it's a simple hop across. We don't get the same sense of height, scale, or danger. 
you actually descend from a higher area to reach it, and then start climbing again straight after. You might not even realise that it's supposed to be the same bridge. It takes it from being a focal point to something utterly forgettable. Now the encounter with the T-Rex is not only my favourite moment from the original Tomb Raider, it's a standout moment of game design in general. I talked at length about this in my review of the 90s Tomb Raider, but that build-up and the various options for taking on the beast, which included dodging and avoiding it, was nothing short of sensational. It was truly dynamic and groundbreaking for its time. The reimagining turns us into the Bane boss fight from Arkham Asylum. You aggro the boss, it charges, you dodge, it hits something, it takes damage, repeat. It loses everything that made the original so special and replaces it with a basic boss fight that we've already seen and done hundreds of times in other games. It is, frankly, a slap in the face. It doesn't even work as intended. Here are clips of me clearly getting the T-Rex to charge into the convenient spiked pillars, but the cutscene for the spikes breaking and the T-Rex getting hurt not triggering. The T-Rex is the poster boy for Anniversary's team completely failing to understand the assignment. They didn't have a grasp on what made this encounter so special and memorable. They robbed the player of dynamic decision making and therefore any agency. This reimagining completely failed here. To be fair, there might be a good reason for this. One of the game's many unlockables is developer commentaries where Toby Gard and Jason Botter talk through their creative thought process. Let's see what they had to say about the T-Rex fight. I mean, um, obviously adding in the kind of concept that you use the environment against them instead of just shooting them, because that was always the problem with the uh, TR1 bosses was that we didn't have time to really do anything special for the fights against the bigger monsters. It's still just essentially just putting as much lead in them as physically possible and adding in the environmental stuff to this um, seemed like the most sensible way to big up that combat. There you have it, straight from the horse's mouth. It was a conscious decision that they felt was a genuine upgrade from the original game. What really upsets me about this is Toby's comment about being unable to do anything special for the original fight. It implies that Toby doesn't realise or understand that the original fight was special, albeit accidentally and due to time constraints. My disappointment continued in Qualipex's tomb. Before, we had three puzzle rooms to the right, which unlocked a path to the Skion on the left. Now, two of those puzzle rooms to the right have been removed, leaving only one recognisable section of this area. The path to the Skion is now straight ahead, and the other two switches to open it have been relocated to this damaged main starting chamber and a new platforming challenge on the path to the left. Getting to each of these routes is irritating, as the tomb is in a much more damaged and crumbling state than its original, fully intact incarnation. You have to push and pull these platforms to create paths to jump along, but the camera angle means you can't really see where you're putting them until it's too late, while the squirrely controls means that you don't have a good feel for how far Lara can jump in the first place. It's… a mess. When we do reach Qualipex Chamber and the Skion itself, we have some more changes that I'm not fond of. An easter egg in the original release saw this Atlantean fall towards you if you got too close. It was unnerving, completely missable, and contributed to that eerie, spooky, underlying horror vibe that was inherent to Tomb Raider. But this is a team that is terrified of you missing any of their efforts and dedicated to trimming the fat and eliminating waste. So of course we now see that same lunge in a cutscene. That it's not interactive means that you don't get to be surprised or respond. In the original I've seen players immediately hop back and draw their guns in a momentary panic, but that interaction is lost here. There's also a new addition. 
Qualapec gets up from his throne, seemingly still with some life left in him, before being cut off by falling rubble. The first time around, it is creepy and unexpected, but they don't really do anything with this, it just sort of happens. Peru ends with a showdown against one of Natla's hired guns, Larson. This fight is still here, but as mentioned, it's now a quick time event, so I consider this to be a massive downgrade over the original. Wow, Peru's report card is pretty damning. Let's see if Greece can do any better. St. Francis Folly is an infamous level that you either love or hate. No doubt this area presented some of the toughest decisions for the developers. Let's talk just outright cuts and removals first. The gorilla room with the switch at the start, banished to the cutting room floor. The slope into a swim with a crocodile, an area that held two of the secrets, yeah, no, that's out of here. In terms of changes and additions, there are almost too many to list. The opening area has a new puzzle that involves shooting specific areas of this carving. That puzzle is also used to replace the tough as nails platforming secret. Now there's just an optional extra solution to that puzzle, which unlocks a gate. In the main chamber, all of the rooms have been renamed to represent Greek gods instead of the mix of Greek and Norse deities of the original. The timed race at the bottom for a secret is no longer timed and only requires you to get halfway down the shaft. The Poseidon Challenge has been greatly expanded, featuring rising and lowering water levels, which somewhat tutorializes the upcoming system. Overall, I think St. Francis Folly was handled well. It's recognisable and the changes made generally helped to improve the flow and soften what was previously a bit of a difficulty spike and dropping off point for many players. While St. Francis Folly is faithful enough to at least be recognisable, the same can't be said for the Colosseum. The entire level has been reimagined. Where the original saw you enter from the stands of a rectangular arena, completing two areas underground and four challenge rooms in each upper corner to escape, Anniversary has you enter a circular arena from the Gladiator's Pit before following a much more linear path to the exit. On the one hand, the sense of scale is different. In the original, entering from the stands, literally being above the enemies below, gave you a sense of power and superiority. Entering into the pit and immediately having to fight in the remake instead makes you feel smaller, more fragile, and as though you're there as someone else's entertainment. It's perhaps the only time this reimagining not only captures the emotions of the original game, but enhances them. Lara seems insignificant in the very apparent grander scheme. There's a sense of mortality and danger here that's rarely repeated throughout Anniversary. It's a shame that the rest of the level feels so forgettable and straightforward. The frequent shootouts with Pierre are absent, I already talked about the massive downgrade to the Magnum's location. With the four corner rooms gone, the level loses any sense of signposting or progression with no standout moments. It's incredibly bland and disappointing as a result. The nicest thing I can say about this version of the Colosseum is that it runs better than the slideshow that is the original Saturn incarnation. That brings us to a redesigned Palace Midas. We enter from a hallway, not the pool. The pool is actually our exit now. We're immediately faced with the Statue of Midas, which already has one gold bar informing us of our goal. Now, I don't mind this. In the original we could only see the statue's legs, and the whole thing was hidden away, only being discovered part way through the stage. It makes contextual sense for the statue to be proudly displayed. Whoever built it to honour and revere Midas would give the statue pride of place, and this change also allows for improved conveyance. 
you quickly know what's expected of you and what your objectives are. The puzzles and challenges themselves are surprisingly faithful to the original game. Sure, the overall stage is shorter and simpler, but in a way that allows Palace Midas to end before it can overstay its welcome. The Fire Room in particular gets an impressive upgrade. It's no longer just a series of linear jumps, now it's an intricate obstacle course of varying hazards. It also houses quite possibly the hardest relic to obtain in the game, requiring an optional route to a timed switch, forcing you to speedrun and damage boost through what's already a tricky section. Sure, Midas is very guilty of assaulting you with enemies in tight corridors seemingly every five minutes, but if the overall level design had this much care and thought put into it as it clearly has in Midas throughout the entire game, I would be much kinder to Anniversary. Sadly, we immediately go from one extreme to the other as we enter the cistern. Sorry, I mean the Tomb of Tihokan. The final two levels of Greece have been merged. Now the system had its issues in the original, being obfuscated to the point of including a potential softlock if you did things out of the developer's intended order, which was relatively easy to accidentally stumble into. I even accused it of dragging on too long and not knowing when to end. There were certainly opportunities for improvement. I believe the Anniversary team went to the extreme though. They cut everything other than the main chamber. Thanks to VG Cartography's maps, I can show you exactly how much we lost. That's a severe cut. They then massively simplified the core puzzle to the point that you can solve it entirely on autopilot. The system's exit takes us directly to the pool in front of Tihokan's final resting place. Originally, this crypt was at the end of a much longer standalone level, meaning that the developers have effectively cut all of this too. Thanks again to VG Cartography for these isometric maps. You're effectively losing an entire level here. Instead of looking at the grievances people, myself included, had with the latter half of Greece and making it better, the team decided to just amputate the entire limb instead, losing the good along with the bad. I've already discussed the boss here in the combat section, and believe me we will talk about that cutscene in the story section. Regrettably, Greece ends apathetically with one of the laziest levels seen so far. Surprisingly, things actually improve as we move into Egypt. Carmoon is still split into the City and Obelisk stages, although the City of Carmoon has been renamed to the more fitting Temple of Carmoon, and you still find yourself back where you started to open a larger door to the Sanctuary of the Skion. The core structure of this section of the game remains effectively the same as it was before. First and foremost, the first key you need is no longer hidden in the back of the Sphinx's head at the start of City, making this an immediate improvement over the original. The bulk of the stage has this air of being familiar yet different in a similar sense to St Francis Folly. You can recognise rooms and set pieces from the original game, making this one of the rare instances of Anniversary feeling like a love letter towards its inspiration. This is how you do it right. The tweaks that have been made improve the level's flow and evolve existing challenges while respecting and using the key structures of the original game. Had every level been approached in the same way as City of Carmoon, I would have been much happier with the game. As we get into the obelisk, things start to noticeably diverge. Yes, this is the same stage with the same goal, get the four keys and return to the start of City of Carmoon, but the challenges have been updated to make use of the new controls and Lara's new abilities, especially the grappling hook. One particular vertical shaft 
sees you timing your swings across saw blades that are coming out of the wall, and it's incredibly rewarding to finally nail it. That said, these crush blocks positioned along perches that Lara can easily fumble? Nah, whoever added these sections is a masochist and should not be trusted. I died so many times to this in ways that did not feel like my fault. Likewise, the Sanctuary of the Skion has these crush blocks and it took me multiple failed attempts to realise that they had indents which would allow me to duck and remain safe. Regrettably, that's not the Sanctuary's only problem. You still enter by blasting your way up a main staircase, albeit shortened and with fewer enemies, but you will never return here. The original game loved to use level designs that looped around on themselves, where the exit was maybe only 10 feet from your starting position, just behind a locked door or a puzzle that forced you to take the long way around. Sanctuary of the Skion was one of the most obvious examples of this, with the exit being behind a locked door to your left as you enter the stage, but Anniversary turns this level into a much more linear affair. At the top of the stairs is one of the game's more annoying puzzles. You have to turn these pillars to display certain hieroglyphs, but turning one pillar also turns the two adjacent to it. It's fiddly and frustrating. You can find yourself here for a while if you're not careful. Save yourself a headache, turn any of the pillars 180 degrees, then turn the pillar diagonally opposite 180 degrees as well to solve the puzzle quickly and easily. I suspect this might be a developer shortcut solution to save time in testing, and I am glad it effectively makes this pain in the ass skippable. Once we reach the main chamber, we discover that one of the more intricate and engaging platforming challenges, which felt like a miniature puzzle box of finding safe ledges and choosing the right jumps for each gap, is gone. In its place is a pair of broken staircases that are comparatively much easier to overcome. The rooms this chamber then led to are swapped out for the same pillar rising puzzle repeated twice with only minor differences. Thankfully, the stunning swim down to the bottom of these two large statues is still intact and still takes your breath away. I think I'd have had to walk away from the game to calm myself down and come back to it later if they had been absent. Sadly, the final room no longer features a face-off with Larson. Instead, you have a few pillars to quickly navigate in order to reach two switches and open a door to an ultimately anticlimactic close to Egypt. While it had its ups and downs, Egypt had the distinct benefit of feeling the most like Tomb Raider out of any of Anniversary's locations. I largely attribute this to the architecture and blocky level design. The way Egypt is constructed reminds me much more of the 96 game's strictly grid-based layouts. There are cubes everywhere, and the tiled floors make it much easier to judge distance when directly compared with the natural grass and rock textures of previous areas. You're dealing with a lot of right angles and quadrilateral shapes, making Tomb Raider veterans feel much more at home. Egypt made the most convincing and consistent argument for updating Lara's original outing for at the time modern audiences and sensibilities. That section still holds up remarkably well today, given that game design best practices haven't changed too drastically in the decade or so since Anniversary's release. Which Atlantis, sorry, The Lost Island, then ruins. To be fair, it starts off okay. Natla's Mines was easily my least favourite level in the 96 outing. You started with no weapons, the first of many threads to pull on was behind a waterfall, and it was rife with mechanical inconsistencies, such as whether doors opened on approach or after pulling a switch. The challenges for the free fuses you need have been entirely replaced for, in my opinion, fairer segments that better communicate what's expected of you. Instead of getting ambushed by the cowboy while still unarmed, Larson only appears after you get your pistols back, and trust me, we will talk about that encounter in the story segment of this video. The route forward is immediately obvious, you no longer have to dangle from an unassuming and random part of a sheer cliff face. 
The final task of opening the Great Pyramid has been adapted to take advantage of Lara's new perch ability, with playing hopscotch across it feeling like a victory lap. Granted, the difficulty length and complexity of this stage have all been reduced. You miss out on some puzzles, and all three fights with Natla's goons are replaced with less interactive QTEs. You could argue that Natla's Mines has been dumped down, but as someone who hates the original version, I personally like this rebalanced take on the level. Of course, Anniversary then immediately reverts to form with its version of Atlantis. First of all, it's been renamed to the Great Pyramid, which was originally the name of the final level. Yeah, this doesn't get to be Atlantis. In fact, a cutscene goes out of its way to tell us that this pyramid is just one remnant of the Greater Atlantean Empire. Now look, I can see why people may have raised an eyebrow at the original name. Atlantis is a sunken city. This place is a pyramid hidden inside a volcano. The two are nothing alike. Even so, taking Lara and Natla's final salvo from the heart of Atlantis to just some random fortress the Atlanteans had really robs the finale of gravitas and wow factor. The original had me thinking, this is Atlantis? This is nothing like I had expected, and that's awesome. This new version has me going, oh wow, one of Natla's old facilities while the game explicitly tells me that there are more of these structures out there somewhere in Tomb Raider's world. I'll talk about this more in the story section, as that is something the franchise never followed up on or took advantage of to my knowledge, so it's just a lame emotion that has never sat well with me. The stage itself focuses around a central shaft that you have to ascend. Back in the day, this meant weaving in and out of the central column through twisting and winding tunnels that threw combat, puzzle, and platforming challenges at you. Each time you survived a grueling ordeal, you'd come back to the center of this stage, look down, and feel a sense of pride over how much higher up you were now. The reimagining just has you climb the shaft with a series of timed switches leading to grappling hooks and jumps around the walls of the chamber. It is, in no way, shape, or form as epic, memorable, or rewarding as the original. It feels like over half of the level is missing here, and that's because it is. The Great Pyramid drives straight past the definition of stripped down and directly into lazy territory. This is what a lack of effort and care feels like. Even if this is your first experience of Tomb Raider, you will feel disappointed. Again, we do have developer commentary for this decision, so let's at least hear them out. Maybe I'm unfairly jumping to conclusions. So the center of the pyramid was sort of this giant shaft that went up the middle. In the original game, Laura just sort of jumped from one sort of periphery room to the other off of this main area. And so we really wanted to get Lara back into this big, vast space with the uh, constant fear of falling into the lava in the bottom. And so we sort of cut all the side rooms off and ended up actually taking some of them and reordering the areas and putting them later in the level. Uh, but we really just wanted to let Lara sort of really traverse this big old giant shaft of uh, nothing that leads up to the Skion room at the top. Big old shaft of nothing. I couldn't have said it better myself. This is another downgrade that was a purposeful decision from a team that didn't understand the assignment. The trend of asking, wait, is that it? continues in the final conflict, the new name for what was originally the Great Pyramid. Where do I even start with this one? The final level of Tomb Raider is a firm favorite of mine. It's brutally unfair, but it also had that element of, just one more try, I'll get it this time. There have been times where I fired up Tomb Raider 96 just to play through that final level again. It's that good. In my review of the original game, I described it as a grueling final exam, a game of chess against level designers where each of us was trying to outdo the other in a way that felt personal and engaging. Getting to the end was an absolute triumph, an earned and satisfying victory over seemingly impossible odds. 
the new version of the level was over before I knew it. We have the same aggroed and headshot boss fight that the game has already used a hundred times, we have some climbing and platforming that could be done while you're asleep at the wheel and lasts maybe five minutes, stuff that lacks the inventiveness, tension, or tenacity of the original. It would be too kind to even call it a pale, toothless imitation. Honestly, my greatest enemy was the game's controls here. And when you emerge maybe five minutes later, your final boss fight against Natala is reduced to another aggro and headshot snooze fest where you finish her off in a goddamn quick time event. You don't even get to kill her yourself. Oh, and that final platforming challenge to escape after the fight? Yeah, forget that, straight to credits. You won, but man, it really doesn't feel like it. What happened here? Where's running headfirst across crumbling platforms towards a boulder, past a scythe, down two slopes away from more boulders, leaping past another scythe over a lava pit, and then sprinting through a room that's flooding with molten magma? Did the team run out of time? Was this finale made at 4pm on a Friday afternoon by a guy who just wanted to get to the pub? This level single-handedly scrubbed away any goodwill the game had built for itself through St. Francis Folly, Palace Midas, both of the Carmoon stages, and even Natla's Mines. What a letdown! Before we move on, there's one final level we need to talk about. You'll remember I said that the opening mountain climb now acts as a tutorial instead of Croft Manor. You might be wondering where that leaves Croft Manor and what it's used for. Would you believe me if I said a puzzle box reminiscent of the original Resident Evil that's way better than it has any right to be? Sure, you won't be facing any zombies, but Lara's home presents a series of locks and keys in the form of skill checks, item combinations, and… actual locks and keys. You have a couple of different starting points. I absolutely recommend prioritising getting the pistols and grappling hook first, as some of the other sections are impossible without them, but yeah, this was a surprisingly fun hour of asking, what maniac designs a house like this? I don't want to spoil too many puzzle solutions here, so I'm being selective with my footage, and I'm not going to spend too long talking about it. All I'll say is that an optional level that most people will probably skip has no right being this fun. See? I can say nice things about Anniversary. Now you might assume that 10 years of technological progress must mean that Anniversary at least looks better than the original game, right? In terms of graphical fidelity, sheer polygon counts and texture resolutions? Yes, absolutely. This version of the game is much easier on the eyes. In terms of aesthetic, art direction, and overall vibe? No, not even close. The Uncanny Valley is the theory that the closer graphics get to realism, the more likely we are to notice flaws, scrutinise them, or be made to feel uneasy by them. That has great applications for the horror genre. Weirdly, Tomb Raider 96 is an outlier in that it benefits from the inverse of the Uncanny Valley. Let me explain. The limitations of early 3D gaming, particularly the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation, meant that every asset of the original outing was blocky, with low resolution textures and difficult to read. The PlayStation 2 was a massive leap forwards, an obvious and significant improvement, the likes of which we just don't see between console generations anymore. Even in the lowest fidelity PlayStation Portable release of Anniversary, significantly higher polygon counts and increased texture resolutions means that we can instantly recognise exactly what everything is supposed to be. It's counterintuitively that same familiarity that detracts from the sense of exploring lost civilizations and alien cultures. In 1996, our imaginations had to do a lot of heavy lifting on the game's behalf. That sense of, what is that, aided in the overriding sense of caution and danger that I have continuously praised that title for. 
anniversary loses that appeal. Every structure and object matches something that we would expect to see in our everyday lives. It loses that eerie quality. You're no longer second-guessing yourself before approaching something. That double-edged sword might just be me, though. I could see and accept arguments saying that I'm crazy, or reaching, or blinded by nostalgia. What is agreeable is that the art direction is lacking in Anniversary. The environments of the original Tomb Raider are colourful, reverent, and vibrant. These are temples constructed to preserve, protect, and worship a civilization's leaders. They are inherently celebratory, deifying their rulers. These were built with materials and paints that would last, stand the tests of time, and allow future generations to appreciate the people's rich history. Not only is this environmental storytelling, it's visually attractive and helps separate and define each of the game's four key locations. You can look at a screenshot from Tomb Raider 1 and tell which part of the game it's from. Tomb Raider Anniversary is much more muted, desaturated, and dusty. These places are crumbling, in a state of disrepair. Sure, that neglect, that lack of upkeep, that deterioration might be more realistic, but it's also kind of dull and boring. The game doesn't take my breath away or convey these lost societies in the same way that its inspiration effortlessly achieved. There's no sense of wonder or awe to these versions of these locations. Now, granted, the contrast, saturation levels, and visual effects do differ from version to version, but let's save that for the version comparison. The environments also suffer from a lack of care and attention to detail. In the level design section, I complained about the waterfalls in Lost Valley. I showed you that these waterfalls don't actually go anywhere, unlike the original, making you wonder why the valley doesn't flood, while ultimately cheapening your surroundings, making them feel like a film set rather than a real place. And then we have Atlantis. I loved the original Atlantis for defying expectations. The level was made out of seemingly living, pulsating tissue. It was outright body horror. It remains one of the creepiest locations in all of gaming. Think about Resident Evil 2 2019's True Final Boss, Devil May Cry 5's Wretched Arenas, and Doom Eternal's Hellscapes. Granted, those are more current PS4 outings, but imagine the leap the PS2 could have provided to these grotesque Atlantean abominations. How squelchy and sickly this structure of sinew could have felt. I bet you can't wait to see it, right? Well, too bad, because the reimagining takes a completely different direction, taking more inspiration from Stargate Atlantis than Tomb Raider 1996. The first warning sign is that the golden entrance is now a more refined and understated silver. Once you're inside, the pulsating walls of flesh are replaced with sleek black stone adorned with intricate golden etchings, completely removing the eldritch horror vibes. More frustrating is that the game shows you that it absolutely could have gone for the grotesque had it wanted to, with the penultimate boss emerging from a beating heart-shaped meat cocoon instead of the golden egg it once hatched from. That's as metal as it gets, and I don't understand why they didn't go all in. It continues to be an overwhelming letdown. I was furious about this in 2007, yes the reimagining actually missed the 10 year anniversary, and I'm still bitter about it 16 years later in 2023. <laughs> My biggest complaint with Tomb Raider Anniversary concerns the story and characterization. This may go without saying, but we're about to enter massive spoiler territory here. Use the timestamp on screen to skip ahead if you don't want to be spoiled. Let's start with our leading lady, Lara herself. The first thing that we need to understand is that Lara's upbringing and motivations have changed. In the original games, Lara's parents had effectively disowned her, 
they did not agree with her lifestyle. In-game, we only see a glimpse of what we believe to be Lara's parents at Lara's funeral in Chronicles. Adventuring was a decision Lara made for herself, despite considerable pushback and resistance. In Anniversary, Lara is heavily motivated by her parents. The previous game, Tomb Raider Legend, started a new, rebooted era of Tomb Raider with its own canon and continuity. We learned that Lara and her mother Amelia had been in a plane crash together. They came across an old temple where Lara activated an ancient artifact that caused Amelia to disappear. The mystery surrounding Amelia's disappearance consumed Lara's father, Richard, who was an archaeologist. He launched multiple expeditions looking for answers about his wife's fate. Sadly, Richard would ultimately pass away during one of those digs. Tomb Raider Anniversary takes place in this new continuity. This version of Lara was encouraged by her parents. She's heavily motivated by her mother's disappearance and her father's death. She's following in her dad's footsteps. At the start of the game, Natla even uses this to get Lara to sign on with her. Which is precisely why I've come to you, Miss Croft. This is a game you've played before, with your father. You both spent years searching for the Skion of Atlantis. All you needed was the location of Qualopex's tomb. You found Vilcabamba. How quickly can you get to Peru? In fact, Lara's relationship with Natla is also drastically changed. Originally, Natla hired Lara because she was famous for being the best there is at what she does. Natla viewed Lara as nothing more than a tool. There was nothing personal about it. This time, Anniversary is part of a trilogy, that being Legend, Anniversary, and Underworld. We would discover that Natla had worked with Richard before, and that she murdered him. This time around, Natla didn't choose Lara by flicking through a phone book. It was personal, it was malicious, and it was in the full knowledge of what a Croft is capable of. It even leads to Natla offering Lara a seat besides her towards the end of the game, ruling over a new era together. What is it you desire, Natla? It takes three to rule. Tihokan and Qualopec were too weak to destroy what stands in the way of the Seventh Age. But you have the strength to claim this seat beside me. Immortality has its price. But what are a few lives to sacrifice for your dreams? Initially, Natla's plan was very simple. To force the world to achieve the next stage of human evolution. Evolution's in a rut. Natural selection at an all-time low. Shipping out fresh meat will incite territorial rages again. Will strengthen and advance us, even create new breeds. Kind of evolution on steroids, then. A kick in the pants. There's no indication that Natla wanted to rule over anyone or anything. She wanted to cause chaos, sit back with some popcorn, and enjoy the show. If she had wanted to rule, it's unlikely to have been a power that she would have wanted to share with anyone else, making her It Takes Three to Rule line seem out of character. If she truly believed that, why did she try to usurp Qualopec and Tihokan, seemingly making a play to take all of the power for herself? Natla effectively goes from being an ancient agent of chaos of a lost world, who sees Lara as nothing more than a bad rash she can't seem to get rid of, a minor annoyance, a fly in the ointment, someone she fatally underestimates, to being a much more petty and vindictive villain. She's immortal! Why does she care about the fleeting lifespans of Richard and Lara Croft? What changed, and why doesn't she see humans as being beneath her anymore? That's simple. Her inclusion and reappearance in Tomb Raider Underworld. A game where the story plays out like bad fanfiction. I can respect and enjoy Legend. It was a reboot. It was an, at the time, self-contained story before its antagonist Amanda came back onto the scene in Underworld. The new gameplay mechanic suited the shift in focus and the new villain. Anniversary seemingly exists so that Underworld can use Natla alongside Amanda. 
so that the new games can ride the coattails of the original's legacy. Legend did well, but somehow the team lost the confidence and integrity to forge a new path, instead using Natla as a crutch. That dislike of Underworld retroactively taints Anniversary for me, introducing a conscious bias when I replay this game. Something I expected a future game to follow up on, which to my knowledge has never been clarified, is the whereabouts and status of the other two rulers of Atlantis, Qualapec and Tihokan. Qualapec gets up from his throne as you're leaving his tomb, implying he might still be alive. He's cut off by rubble before he can pursue Lara, and we have no idea if he survived. Meanwhile, Tihokan's coffin is shown to be empty in a lingering shot that's clearly setting up a wider mystery, yet this thread is seemingly never mentioned again throughout the series. Are Qualapec and Tihokan out there somewhere? And if they are, why aren't they doing anything about Natla? They're the ones who sealed her in the first place. As the third ruler of Atlantis, she's very much their problem to deal with. Part of me wondered if Atlantis was demoted to the Lost Island, which goes to lengths to explain is now just one remnant of the Atlantean Empire, so that Qualapec, Tihokan, and Atlantis proper could feature in a future title that never came to be. Back on track, the lineup of Natla's goons and how Lara interacts with them is also changed for the worse. First and foremost, we don't get to fight them. Every single human enemy is dealt with in quick time events, robbing the player of any agency. The character most impacted by this gameplay change is Pierre. In the original, you would fight him multiple times throughout the Grease chapter. He would show up at inconvenient times, you had a gunfight with him, and he would eventually run away. Finally, you would catch up to him, gun him down for good, and take the second piece of the ski on from his freshly dead corpse. That felt satisfying. You were given a genuine rivalry through gameplay mechanics alone that you got to resolve. It was cathartic. He hadn't been taunting and upsetting Lara, the character, he had been ruffling the feathers of you, the player. You had a genuine relationship with this antagonist. Anniversary gives us one cutscene introducing Pierre, the odd echoey soundbite from him as you explore the Grease levels, and then he's killed by Atlantean centaurs in a cutscene. You never directly interact with Pierre, you never form that rivalry, you never get that payoff. Anniversary could cut Pierre entirely, and the game would be exactly the same to play. This is yet another fundamental mishandling of one of the original's greatest assets, and more evidence that the new team didn't understand what made the original game stand out. Larson is at the centre of some of the biggest narrative and thematic changes. In the original game, you gunned Larson down to get the third and final piece of the ski on. Immediately after, you're ambushed by Natla and her men, including a cowboy that some mistook for the recently deceased Larson. Anniversary swaps the boss fight out for a puzzle and replaces the cowboy with Larson. That's cool, that makes sense. Combining two very similar characters who serve the same purpose into one character is efficient. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with his death. Let's see how it unfolds. I don't have time for this. Get out of the way or you die. <laughs> what you gonna do, shoot me? Come on, Lyra. I just work here. Now I know how bad you want this, but I can't let you pass. And we both know you're not gonna kill me for it. That's just not who you are. I'm not who you think I am. Lara then guns Larson down, in a QTE of course, and acts horrified at having killed another human being, a theme that continues to play out throughout the rest of this portion of the game, with Lara looking at her hands both immediately after Larson's death and during the game's ending. This is when you suddenly realise why you weren't allowed to fight Pierre in Greece, and when you clock that Natla's other minions kill each other. Lara's hands are relatively clean in that instance. 
Larson and Natler are the only people Lara directly kills, and even then, Natler is an immortal Atlantean who returns in the next game, so... just Larson then. This seems strange to me. The original game's Lara didn't have this moral quandary, this conscience to contend with. If you got in her way, you had a bullet with your name on it. Simple as that. And it's not like it fits her new reboot timeline characterization either. The previous game, Legend, saw Lara gunning down waves of human enemies as if she had a quarterly quota to fulfil, causing me to presume that Legend takes place after Anniversary, despite the release order. It's as if a writer wanted to add depth to Lara's character without understanding who that character was in the first place. The unlockable character bios give us some interesting context to Natla's remaining grunts, despite this not being explored or capitalised on in-game. Skateboard Kid and Jacket Guy now have names, Jerome the Kid Johnson and Cold Kin Kane. Prior to the events of the game, Cold killed all of Kid's gang on Natla's behalf. Kid was left alive and hired by Natla, but with reluctance and resentment on Kid's part. With this additional information, Cold stabbing Kid, and Kid subsequently shooting Cold, makes a lot more sense. The scene was admittedly a little random beforehand, with Cold seemingly just wanting the glory, and Kid responding with, If I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. I like that they at least tried to give these characters some backstories and motivations of their own. Overall though, this is a worse retelling of the plot that tries to fix events and characters that were never broken. It feels like there were egos at play in the writer's room, and that putting their own stamp on the tail was more important than understanding or paying tribute to the original story. So, version comparisons. If you were to play Anniversary for yourself, which release should you go for? That's not as straightforward a question as it might seem. Usually you might assume that the PC version is going to be the way to go, and that's certainly what I've used for the majority of my footage here, with it still being available to buy digitally while offering the highest resolutions and frame rates. In Tomb Raider Anniversary's case, there are some surprising considerations for the game's aesthetics, bonus content, and even version-unique features and changes. Let's start with the PlayStation 2 version, because it's low-key one of the more interesting and technically impressive of this game's various ports. First of all, the options blew me away. This is a PAL PlayStation 2 game that offers progressive scan, a 60Hz refresh rate, and a widescreen option? Normally, we have to choose one of the three. It's rare that us Europeans, and Australians, don't worry lads, I got ya, got to enjoy this holy trifecta. Weirdly, the game does seem to display in a letterbox. Originally, I wondered if this was just my capture setup, but no, the game's cutscenes use a full screen width, so I'm not sure what's going on here. This version has a seemingly unique bloom and blurring effect that I didn't see replicated in the other versions, with many objects kind of glowing and lots of edges having resulting halos. I can promise you that these peculiarities are unique to this game and not a result of my capture, with other PS2 games looking clean. This appears to be intentional and might not be to everyone's tastes. The PS2 version is also amongst the most colourful. It's much more vibrant and saturated with high contrast, although that did result in not being able to see where I was going when navigating certain corridors. Outside of the game itself, the PS2 version came as a beautiful box set that packs in a soundtrack CD and making of DVD. A lot of care clearly went into this release, and it's overall quite impressive, running and playing far better than I expected. I have similar praise for the PSP version which, considering the hardware it's running on, has no business looking or playing as well as it does. In the age of the Switch and the Steam Deck, this might seem lost on some of you, but I can't stress how phenomenal it was to be able to play full console games on a handheld. Normally, if a game got a Game Boy Advance or DS port, it was an entirely different game, sharing only a name with its console counterpart. 
the PSP was, to my knowledge, the earliest machine to say, no, we're not doing that. Here's the full console experience on the go. In fact, the PSP version includes three version exclusive unlockable costumes. I'm admittedly not willing to replay the entire game again while meeting the unlock requirements, so enjoyed these screenshots from Stella's Tomb Raider site, which credits Treeball for the images. Not only that, but while all of the console versions of the game seem to target 30 frames per second, the PSP version appears to shoot for 60. It doesn't consistently achieve it, not even close, but that it even tries is incredible. Visually, it might not be too impressive blown up on a PC monitor or TV, but on the PSP's relatively small phone-sized screen, it looks great. The lower physical size leads to a much higher pixel density, which does a lot to mask the low native resolution. My only real complaint is the controls. Maybe the stick is on the way out on my PSP, but Lara slowed down every time I moved diagonally. I eventually started using the shoulder buttons to rotate the camera as I ran forwards for smoother turning and motion. Rounding out the standard definition versions, we have the Wii release, which I'm running on a Wii U here. To address the elephant in the room, yes, there are motion controls here and you can aim your guns with them. It was fiddly, to say the least. Thankfully you also get a lock-on option, which I quickly defaulted to. The back of the case doesn't list any controller support, and I wasn't able to get a Wii Classic controller to work, so as far as I can tell, those motion controls are your only option. There are also extra activities which are unique to the Wii version. For example, you have to grab and turn gears to open these doors in the city of Vilcabamba. I hesitate to call them puzzles, though. The only one which really annoyed me was this puzzle in the very first level. I'm still not entirely sure what I was supposed to be doing or how I solved it. You're not missing out by their exclusion from the other releases. In terms of presentation, the game seemed to be stuck in a weird aspect ratio, making things seem squashed. There's also a heavy use of dithering, especially for smoke, smog, and other effects. I'm not sure if it'll be as prominent in this footage after YouTube's aggressive compression, but I haven't seen dithering this heavy since the PS1. If you don't have any other way of playing the game, then I guess the Wii version is fine, however, make no mistake, this port is at the very bottom of the pecking order. Moving up to the HD versions, the Xbox 360 version claims to be 1080p on the back of the box, but in practice feels like it uses a variable internal resolution which is then upscaled to 1080p. With the T-Rex boss arena, no that poor dinosaur cannot catch a break, looking noticeably more pixelated and alias than other areas. Now, I'm seeing this while playing on an Xbox Series X, so while the game is backwards compatible, it doesn't appear to enjoy any performance boosts. This version's presentation sees all of the colour drained from the image. This era of gaming is harped on for being quote, grey and brown. Playing the different versions back to back like this really emphasises that those claims aren't the typical internet echo chamber hyperbole. There's actually some truth to this one. As mentioned previously, the game is available either standalone or as DLC for Tomb Raider Legend, proving how much of Legend's DNA is in Anniversary. I haven't bought and played the Legend's DLC, I honestly don't see why anyone would, but research indicates it's the same experience as the standalone title. Ultimately, the Xbox 360 release is fine. As a port, it's largely unremarkable. It gets points for still being available to purchase on the Xbox storefront as of the writing of this video, making it one of only two releases you can still buy first hand. The PC release is what we've been seeing throughout this video as the release I used for my main playthrough. Normally, I would caveat that any PC version's performance is going to be dependent on your hardware, that your mileage may vary, and that I'm running an Intel i9-10900K, which runs at 3.7GHz with 10 cores and 20 threads, 
paired with an RTX 3070 and 32GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 RAM at 3200MHz. However, with the game being 16 years old at this point, I would imagine it would run perfectly at 1080p 60fps max settings on even entry level PCs. Essentially, this is the HD console version of the game, but able to run at an actual 1080p and 60fps. There are some quirks, the tutorial text shows keyboard inputs even if you're using a controller, despite the options menu containing default controller bindings, and the QuickTime event inputs are simplified over its console counterparts. But this is, generally speaking, the best experience you can have with the game. Compared to the Xbox 360 version, which is $14.99GBP, the Steam version can be purchased for just $6.99 on Steam and GOG, making it the cheaper of the two releases. Finally, we come to the PlayStation 3 version, which was late to the party. While Tomb Raider Legend and Tomb Raider Anniversary never had standalone PlayStation 3 outings, they only ever released on PS2, they were included in Classics HD Tomb Raider Trilogy, which also includes Tomb Raider Underworld. Given that the Classics HD title is typically reserved for ports of PS2 games with an improved native resolution and trophy support, and that both the front and back of the case say Legend and Anniversary Remastered in High Definition, I was curious as to whether this would be a new port of that technically impressive PS2 outing or just another port of the Xbox 360 and Steam versions. Drumroll please! It's just the 360 and PC version again, only this time at a stable 720p and 30fps, with the button prompts changed to the PlayStation's face buttons, and trophies matching the Xbox achievements. Maybe it's my fault for expecting something more interesting, but I'm still disappointed. Before we move on, I wanted to look at the games side by side again for their different treatments of visual effects, especially water. Look at Lara's legs on the Wii and PC version and note the wobbling effect. You can also kind of see it on PS2, but the bloom and smear makes it harder to detect. What seems to be happening here is that the game is projecting the main camera's view onto the water's surface to give the illusion of a reflection. My understanding is that the original Resident Evil 4 used a similar trick. I also find the foam at the bottom of the waterfall revealing. On PS2 it's practically glowing, but that effect disappears on the HD versions, with only the PC port replicating it. Meanwhile, the Wii's take is a divid mess, and the PSP version just doesn't have any foam at all. It's also striking to see just how different the colour treatment is between the SD and HD outings. If I could get the PS2's colour palette combined with the PC's fidelity, I think we would have a perfect look for this game. If we compare the title screens we can get a glimpse into how differently lighting and shading is treated. The PSP seems to forgo real time lighting, which given the hardware is fair enough. Meanwhile, the Wii has quite an exaggerated approach that almost comes across as rim lighting from a light source that seems to be on the opposite side of Lara to the other versions. Both the PS3 and 360 have a hazier appearance to them with limited shading in the environment, while the PC version unsurprisingly gives us the cleanest look overall. If you have a PC, then this is a no-brainer, get that version. Hands down, it's the best and cheapest way to play. If you only have consoles and you would prefer to buy it first hand, rather than searching for a second hand physical copy, which, you know, I recommend, support developers and publishers wherever you can, then your only option is the Xbox 360 digital download. The nicest thing I'll probably ever say about Tomb Raider Anniversary is that none of these versions are outright bad. In fact, some of them genuinely surprised me in a good way, and most of them bring something unique to the table. If you're a weirdo like me with access to the hardware and a willingness to track down some discs, it's actually worth playing the various builds and seeing where they diverge. 
I would be remiss to do a video on Tomb Raider Anniversary, especially one with a version comparison, without mentioning the other PSP version. This was unfortunately scrapped, but it's a different team bringing us a much more faithful take on Tomb Raider 1. Thanks to community efforts, a, and I use this term loosely, playable build can now be found on most sites offering PSP ISOs. If you want to learn more, check out Tomb of Ash. They did a great job extracting and commenting on assets, as well as chronicling what went on behind the scenes, from initial prototype, to pitch, to being canned in favour of the reimagining we ultimately got. It's honestly some quite fascinating history for fans, and there's so much to talk about that it's also way beyond the scope of this already bloated video. All of that said, and a lot has been said here, how do I feel about Tomb Raider Anniversary? Would I recommend it? Game Maker's Toolkit posited that the reason that Resident Evil 2 and 4's respective reimaginings worked so well is that they focus on how the original games made players feel, and they replicated those emotions and responses in the new versions. For me, Tomb Raider Anniversary doesn't do that. It misses the point of Tomb Raider entirely. The original Tomb Raider had this eerie sense of foreboding unfamiliarity. Everything, from its admittedly clunky movement controls, to its purposefully obtuse, maze-like open-plan level design, to its limited save points, to even its technologically limited and therefore uncanny blocky graphics, which left a lot to your imagination, contributed to that feeling. You were not welcome. You were being cautious, you were planning out your moves ahead of time, and you knew that death was around every corner. This reimagined Tomb Raider, with its modernised controls, its more linear, condensed and simplified stages, its frequent automated checkpoints, and its increased graphical fidelity that clearly communicates exactly what you're looking at, evokes entirely different emotions and responses. You don't feel intimidated. You instead feel like a badass action hero, and that's just not the same game at that point. The conflict I'm facing is that I wouldn't expect a modern gamer to go back to the original Tomb Raider. Despite its historical significance and the fantastic experience I consistently get out of it, I believe that my kids would find it too archaic and frustrating. The treasure hunting adventure having itself become something of a relic. I believe the anniversary would be much more palatable to their tastes, with a lower barrier to entry, and that they would be more likely to play through and engage with that version of the adventure. The problem is that anniversary doesn't reflect or represent what made the 1996 game so special to me and millions of other gamers. It's Tomb Raider 1 in name only, bearing only a passing, surface-level, entirely superficial resemblance to its source material. If I were playing and judging this game as a standalone entry into the Tomb Raider franchise, looking at it solely on its own merits, I would probably tell you that, while it has its issues and frustrations, it's fine. A perfectly serviceable and enjoyable game. Something you can beat over the course of a weekend and happily move on from. Assessing it as a reimagining of one of my all-time favourites, I wouldn't be so kind. At the start of the video, I quoted Jason Botter, creative director of Tomb Raider Anniversary, as saying that the team were inspired to create a brand new game, heavily inspired by the original TR. Not just a remake, but something more. And yes, this is a brand new game, loosely based on and inspired by the original Tomb Raider, but I also believe that it's something lesser, a game that fundamentally fails to understand its own inspiration, becoming a generic cookie-cutter offering that lacks the magic and charm of Lara's first outing. A sadly hollow imitation that I cannot enjoy or recommend. Thank you for watching to the end of this incredibly long video. If you've enjoyed, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. It really does help the channel out. I also have a Patreon, which you can find a link for in the description. 
Joining up gets you perks like early scripts, a special Discord role, and other behind the scenes goodies. It really helps out, especially with longer videos like this that take a few months to produce. Speaking of, shout out to Crow, currently my sole patron. This channel also has over 10 years of content, so have a look around. There's bound to be something else of mine you'll want to watch. There's even a couple of suggestions on screen right now that you can click on. Until next time, I've been Sam, and thank you for your time.